Tony. He's Mike, and we're here to talk about 1980s. 1980s. 1980s Jody Foster vehicle, mm -hmm. Foxes. Meet Jeannie, Annie, Madge, and Deirdre. Hey, anything you want, baby? Not from you, slime. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They're Foxes. Um, little side note on this one. Um, this was actually the last film that Jodie Foster did before she left to go to school for Princeton. I thought it was Yale. Or was it, it's some, it, some Ivy yeah, League yeah. school? It doesn't it was, matter. Yeah. Well, no, but but her acting career went on hiatus, so this right. potentially could have been her last film. She did obviously come back. You know, she finished her degree and then she decided to return to acting. But this could have actually been. You're right, and I think you're right. I think it is Yale, actually. Yeah. I. But again, it it doesn't matter. But she um, came back. She's still acting. The funny thing about this is directed by uh, Adrian Lin. I'm. I'm Suppose that's that's the name. Yeah. Uh, but he did a lot of films after this: Flashdance, Nine Half Weeks, Failed Tracks from Jacob's Ladder, and Decent Proposal. Yeah. All fairly decent films. Flashdance was like a phenomenon. Yes. In yeah. nineteen eighty and three, you couldn't go anywhere without hearing that stupid fucking song by Irene Cara. <laughs> I'll throw it here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't beat around the bush. Tell us how you really feel about Irene Cara. Yeah. But, but it also stars uh, um, Scott Baio, who you may know from, yeah. uh, oh, geez. Who's Charles in Charge. Thank you, Charles in Charge. <laughs> Zapped. Ha Happy Days, all that shit. We should maybe be doing a Zap thing, yeah. possibly. Jody loves Chachi. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Randy Quaid is in this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also uh, Shri Kari from The Runaways. Yes. Hello, Mom. I'm in Yeah, yeah. Well, this actually, the runaways. This is her first movie, and she actually did several movies after this did she? Uh, because they were really impressed with her acting. But yeah, she didn't. Do, she didn't. This was her most visible role yeah. that she did. But a lot of people were very impressed by her acting. Ability. No, she did a good acting job. I thought she did just as good as uh, Jodie Foster yeah. in this. Yeah, and in a, a weirder role. When we talk about how how films are different, coming of age films are very different now versus when we were growing up. We were growing up when this movie came out. And this movie is a very honest depiction of the teenage years of us, yeah. for the most part. Yeah. Um, in that there's there's a, several teenage girls. They're all 15 and 16. So, like, they're just getting their driver's licenses and just kind of going out in the world. And they're dealing with broken homes or mm -hmm. overly strict parents yep. or or just parents that are completely unengaged or parents that are too engaged. Yeah. Um, and how their life choices are kind of affecting everything else that's going on uh around them that, that their parents may or may not actually be aware of. Um, and he, he's right. This, this, it's not a fun watch. This no, is, it is not. This is a, a, it's a very heavy themed movie. Um, uh, let's talk about uh, Annie, yeah. who was, who was played by the, the by Sherry singer. Curry. Yeah. Sherry Curry from the runaways. Her dad is a control freak cop. Dad. <laughs> Which is to say that he, it's, it's very obviously put out there that, that he is abusive to both his wife and his daughters. And they actually mentioned that something had happened to her older sister. I don't remember exactly what it was. I don't but, remember what it was either. But he's trying to have her, have Annie's character more or less put into a hospital, a rehab yeah. of sorts. Well, so, she's, well, she's a very troubled girl, too. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. How, I'm sure some of it maybe because she's abused or maybe it's just exacerbated even more because she's got an yeah. overbearing yeah. father that smacks her around instead of, you know, sitting down and talking it's to her. And teenage to rebellion. Her. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, yeah. I, re I read that as teenage rebellion and that the stricter her parents get, her mom is completely checked out. Yeah. Um, and they actually show that, like, when Jodie Foster goes to the house to, to get some of her things because she's like, hey, your daughter, she's going to stay with us for a little while, maybe a couple weeks, just until things kind of calm down around here. And her mom is sitting in a dark room with a very large dog, and she's, like, like muttering stuff. It's, yeah. it's very weird. Mom, mom wants to know if uh, Annie can stay over our house for a couple days. Just so long as her dad doesn't come along with the straight jacket or something. I don't tell the man nothing. Um, it's very weird. It's almost 
almost a horror scene in a way. It's very dark. It's very atmospheric. Yeah. And, and it's uh, like like a like a scene out of a thriller. Because uh, you're waiting for that dog like just go off on uh, Jodie Foster. And I was actually gonna say I don't know if the dog is there to keep people from coming in or to keep the mom from attempting to leave. And I read it. <laughs> I read it kind of as that because I don't know a whole lot of women that would go and get a giant Rottweiler or Mastiff as a stay home pet if you're a stay home mom. You know, um, it's it's it's. No, it's probably obviously trained by the by the cop husband would be my thing. It, yeah. Because because it, it comes very much as a guard dog of some kind or another. Yeah. You know what what what's true purpose is? Who's it guarding? What's it, yeah? You know, no, I don't know. Like you're like you're saying, is it there to keep people in or out, out of the house? That's or the both. big question on that. So <laughs> so you have Annie, and and she's very heavy into drug use. She runs around with some really shady ass people. She is on probation, so she's been told she needs to stay off of Hollywood Boulevard. You're on probation, you dumb shit. You're supposed to stay out of Hollywood. Loser was taking me home. We just stay away from Loser. He's in a street club. Jodie Foster's character. Her mom is a divorced uh, single mom mm -hmm. who is very uninvolved. She's trying to basically, like, find romance. Uh, she's uh, kind of involved, but she's, like, she has very low, she has self-esteem issues. Yeah. You know, she's like, you know, oh, I wish I looked like you girls. You're so lucky and all stuff. Like, I, my, my hips are this, my, yeah. my ass is like that, you know. So it's like, yeah. Uh, and she'll, like, shack up with anybody that gives her, like, you know, uh, a the, nice the, dinner and the time yeah, of day. So exactly. How's your friend, Sam? He seems nice. He's with his wife. Oh, ex-wife. I'm a forty-year-old woman, and I'm sitting here reading Plato again. It's insane. No, he didn't take me to dinner last night, and he didn't take me to dinner tonight, like he said he would, because his ex-wife called and he wasn't free to go. I was too busy throwing myself at some some guy, like all the other divorced, desperate. UCLA undergraduates. Uh, but, but actually, she's played by uh, the original Margaret Houlihan from MASH the movie. Correct. Um, and um, she does a really outstanding job mm -hmm. uh, with, with that actual role. Yeah. It's a very convincing portrayal of that. Yeah. Um, so that's Jodie Foster's character. Then you have... Um, I, I, I you got Madge, who's the... Uh, the one with the glasses. The one with who, the glasses. Whose who's... mom is too involved. Yeah. Um, o o overbearing, overprotective. You know, I, I say that, but at the same time, she was also going to allow her her daughter to have people over, have a party at their house, and, and they bought a cake for them. Mom, I'm trying to get my head into having a good time, okay? If you're going to go and spoil oh, it, I just... come on and laugh a little, for damn sake. Dad and I got the keg of beer, which I still can't believe, but damned if we didn't. What if I told you some of the people don't drink beer? What people? You mean your high school friends? Oh, well, I drink scotch and tequila and stuff like that you drink scotch match no but i could if i wanted i could drink it for breakfast but Kate wasn't good enough for fucking madge she's a no. fucking little twat yeah <laughs> no no madge, madge is a spoiled oh. she's the spoiled girl yes. in the group and and no matter what it is if it's from her parents it's not good enough she's gonna yes. find a reason to complain mm -hmm. because she's dating an older guy and even though she's only 16 she's a virgin which she's like usually ashamed of but this older guy he keeps saying that he loves her and that's randy quaid is the older boyfriend who's obviously in his late 20s early 30s i'm calling your place for weeks i couldn't call back why? I mean, I was like dying. Well, Mom thinks I'm going with Terry. She likes him because he smiles a lot. Well, what's wrong with me? The age thing. Doesn't matter. I mean, my grandmother was having babies at 60. So, which, well, that's a thing now? It wasn't uncommon back then. I, I know it's probably still a little, I mean. It's a little extreme 80, 80, in this. I mean, because that's still 1980, and that's a little young It's a, It's a little young in 1980, then. but I knew a lot of girls in high school that were dating guys that were, you know, 21, 22, yeah. in college. They could get beer because they were dating a guy in college, and, and you know, blah, 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 and he'd drive them there. and, and that. So yeah. this is an extreme version of that, yeah. but uh, it happened. Yeah. It, it most definitely happened. Yeah. And then you have... Um, uh, Dardine. Dardine, who... who's, who's basically like uh, this version, this movie's version of uh, 
a queen bee bitch yes. from uh, Little Darlings. Absolutely, absolutely. She is the girl that she's had sex and she's so worldly and she's the disco queen and everybody wants her and she just plays with this guy and he's going to show up at the concert but I'm going to tell him that I, I had a problem because I invited this guy that I met at the grocery store to go to that concert and I want to actually hang out with him. You see, I have, well that is I had these two tickets to the Angel concert for tonight but I lost them and I thought, you haven't. Yes, but I feel so stupid. I mean, I just found them in my purse. I mean, I already told my date. He's not my boyfriend or anything, you know. He's just my date. But I already told him we couldn't go. And what? Like, what? Oh, God, Greg. Well, if you'd like, but you hardly know whether you would like me. <laughs> it's, yeah. All of the situations in this are very real world. Yes. And, and yeah. the attitudes and the performances, there's not really a straight narrative in this. This is more a series no. of non sequiturs that kind of all tie together with this group of girls. It is not a linear story by any stretch of the imagination. Well, it's linear in, in its timeline. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's just a series of events. And, yeah. and, and basically you're getting to see how all of these girls deal with everything that's going on. So... Just to, to cut to the chase, and because this is a quick and dirty and not a deep dive on this, Madge winds up throwing a party, and then Annie invites well, a at, bunch at, of... At Randy Quaid's house. At Randy Quaid's house, yes. He's, he's out of town, but he's letting her stay there because, you know, they're going to be a serious couple. Yes, well, I, he lets her stay there after she has given her virginity yeah. to him. Yeah. So there's a bit more going on in that. But uh, they decide they're going to have a grown-up dinner party, and they're going to just have a, a few friends over, and they're going to drink bubbly, and it's going to be a wonderful evening. Why don't we ever have a party? A party without Jay? Forget it. Sorry, I'll be right back. Oh, oh, nice. Nice. Everyone start. Well, Annie decides that she's going to invite a bunch of her loser friends over, more seedier elements, and mm -hmm. they naturally invite other people, and it's a house party, and the house party becomes a house fight. <laughs> hey, hey, you ready to go, darling? Hey. Yeah, he's ready to go. Yeah, it turns into a riot. Cops show up. The house is f***ing destroyed. Yep. Randy Quaid comes back, and... Uh, he's less than thrilled. <laughs> less than thrilled. He doesn't hit her. <laughs> no, no, but... He basically uh, come back in. Why are you going to hit me? Yeah, I'm going to hit you. But please come on back in. Yeah, yeah, it's... <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's not funny, but it's funny. Please? Please what? Please come back here so I can beat you up. <laughs> got a chuckle out of me too it was very very weird in that you know like what are you gonna do because she's like oh well, we'll get jobs and we'll pay you back for all the damage and he's like do you have any idea what any of this stuff costs and the answer is obviously no because you're dating a teenager who it's, it's compelling in that if you ever again just for the younger crowd for for Folks our age that, that are not familiar with this movie, I would recommend it because, yeah, you're going to get a big blast of nostalgia from it, and you're going to be like, yeah I, yeah, I remember stuff like that happening, and I remember that girl that was dating the guy that was obviously mm -hmm. older than she should have been dating, but, like, they became a thing, and they're trying to tell everybody how yeah. in love they are, and no, 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 it's fine, it's okay. He really loves her. It's yeah. creepy and yeah. weird, and it's creepy and weird here, yeah. but they're selling it exactly the way that it was sold yeah. Those situations were sold back then. And then, then. You, you, got, you got the girl, that, the, the promiscuous girl. Everybody knows the promiscuous girl. They had one there in their group. Yeah. And you got the, uh, you know, the, the troubled person, whether it's a girl or whether it's a guy, yeah. there's always a troubled person and in their group. And in some instances, then, they're reacting to bad shit that has happened to them or is happening to them. Mm -hmm. And in other instances, they make their situation work worse. with really bad choices. Yes. And that's Annie in yeah. this one to a T. And, and we're going to finish talking about Annie, but we're just going to kind of go through this first. And, and then you got... Um, Jodie Foster's type of character. What, what the hell's her name again? Uh, I, I'm the genie. Yeah, uh, something like that. I'm I, just I going it's, with Jodie. I, it's, when I see Jodie Foster, I don't think, oh, what character is she yeah. playing? I think, oh, there's Jodie Foster. But, <laughs> but it's Jodie Foster, and she has to be like the adult of the group. If you're going to stay with me, you got to go by the rules. And the rules are, we're going to get through this fucking high school. And we're going to get jobs and a bunch of shit like that. And if you don't like that, that's just tough shit. 
She's trying to be the adult. Yeah. She's trying to be the responsible Hold one. On. And weirdly, not only is she trying to be the responsible one in this particular group, but she's also trying to be the responsible one in her relationship with her mother because yeah. she's actually encouraging her mom, hey, quit dating these losers. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're better than this. You're yeah. the, and She's actually a lot like Christy McNichols' character in Little Darlings. Absolutely. Um, and then uh, you have her dad, who's an absentee dad, who's very big in the the music industry. Well, I think he's he's either the manager of Angel or has something to do with it. I, I do he's, believe he's, he's the he's, manager because he's moneyed. He's yes. not he's not a tech. He's not the sound guy. Yeah. He's he's in the thick of it, and he goes on tour with them as yeah. they're going like across Europe and and across the country. This so, and that. So if not the actual manager, or at least a tour manager of some kind or yeah. another. Yeah. Because um, he's always on the road. And and he's the one that's constantly. Hey, you know what? We should spend more time together. And you know, I when I get back from this tour, you know, maybe we'll actually set you up in an apartment in yeah. the valley, and you can do your own thing. Yeah. What you ought to do, you ought to go out and get a nice little place for you and Mum in the valley with some trees around it. I'll pay for it. Mom likes where she is. I'm talking about me, Dad. Yeah, and it, it doesn't come across like a bad guy. He's just in a job that, you know, that he has to, he has to be away all the time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Look, stick with Mum, eh? That Christ is bad enough having an absentee dad. I don't mind. I do. And it's not that I mean, it is what it is. That in the very brief bit of time that yeah. we get with him and Jodie Foster as his daughter, you actually do get a sense that he genuinely does care about his daughter and he does yeah. genuinely love his daughter. And he can't give her time because of his job, so he tries to replace time with money. money. But then we have Annie. Yeah. Annie is she's a user of, of alcohol and quaaludes and, and, and dope, and she hangs out with some really shitty, scummy people. Uh, and she doesn't see that these people are basically out to get from her one way or another until she, you know, runs away from her group and her home and disappears for a while. And Jodie Foster goes and find her. And when they find her, she's like drugged out of her mind in the front seat of a car. And she's like, take me home. And when they try to take her home, these guys get violent. Basically ends up in a, in a car chase where they do actually get Annie uh, away from him. But Annie winds up outside of the truck trying to run away she gets she hitchhikes with a yes. random couple she she and that random and couple is the predators they're straight up predators straight up predators and they're drinking and driving which as weird as it sounds at the time wasn't illegal for you to have a cup of bourbon behind the wheel of a car yeah. and they wind up hitting the back of a truck and killing at least nanny that we know of possibly yeah. everybody else yeah um and and this all ends that like annie's death is the event that kind of gets a lot of the girls to grow up because Madge does get married and and Deidre what is what is her name De, 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 not yeah, Deidre I think it's her name is doesn't yeah. matter anyway uh, she she winds up kind of calming down she actually when they show her at uh, Madge's wedding which they kind of frame it like it's the funeral but it's not. Um, uh, she's kind of mellowed out quite a bit. She's not quite the sex pot anymore, and yeah. she's not like, you know, obsessed with just pursuing whichever guy is in the area. But then we get Jodie uh, Foster, who goes to that, says bye to her mom, gets in her truck, and goes to Annie's grave and has a, a closing conversation with her before she's getting ready to go off to college and roll the credits. Um... I have a complex relationship with this film. I had never I seen too. this before. The guy that wrote this, uh, he actually was basically starting off with the premise of what if we did Little Women, but we said it in 1980 Los Angeles. I get the references. Mm -hmm. um, I, I understand, you know, the, the character archetypes that they're going for and all that. And in that regard, it works really well. Um, but uh, in, in other regards, like some of these characters are just flat unlikable. Nobody in here is too terribly likable. I mean, Jodie yeah. Foster's likable and the mom's relatable, you know, and the, the dad's probably the most likable person in this whole movie at yeah. least for me. But it, like, like you said earlier, it, it, it rings true in a lot of things. It's, I think it's kind of exaggerated some, at some points yeah. with some of the stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people that watch this like, well, no, this doesn't happen. There are people that have shit like this. Well, yeah, this, this shit happens all the time. Maybe that this extreme with so many people in like one group where everybody is in like an, in a broken home or a no. broken family situation or or something like that. But yeah, no, this is pretty f***ing realistic. It's very yeah. dark. And unlike Little Darlings where it's kind of played up for laughs, there is no punches pulled in this no. 
movie whatsoever. No. And that's a hard f to watch. Yeah. I, I, Annie's deaths felt very tacked on. It felt like they just needed to wrap this shit up and, and they kind of threw her into that particular situation. And, and I guess they wanted to show that, that girls like Annie are vulnerable to predators. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. if that's your message, if that's what you were going for, great. You really underwrote it. They really should have, like, you know, if the predators would have been like the, oh, no, 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 you know, if you need anything, come to us, we'll help you out. And that's, yeah. that's when the predation would have actually begun on that yeah. one. It's that, that visage of, we're going to offer you help, but we're not here yeah. to help. We're here to know that when you are absolutely at your lowest, that is when we are going to take advantage of you to the fullest on this one. And, and I feel like with all the other blunt shit that this movie dealt with and, and how it portrayed it, it deserved that level of bluntness with Annie's conclusion on that yeah. one. So, yeah, I mean, I respect the movie for what it did and how blunt it was and very un and unapologetic. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like, is it a recommend? I mean, yes, one time. It's a fucking one and done. And you will never need to watch this fucking movie again. And I'm going to say this, too, for, for the younger crowd that's out there. If you're a millennial or, or, you know, if you're not a Gen X or if you're not, if you're not our age, this is a, a realistic glimpse of what the teenage years were like in the late 70s, early 80s. And, and well, really, with, from uh, the 90s the and the 2000s before, before, you know, social media was a fucking thing. I mean, really... All that shit rang true up until that point, yeah. where, where now it's just a different, a different version well, of they bullying to... and abuse and all that bullshit. Because all that shit still happens now. Sure, you sure. You know, there's still the abusive fucking parents. There's still the fucking overbearing parents. There's sure. still the, you know, um, absent parent and the. Um, but this is before yeah. media tried to sanitize yes. the, what families are like yeah. with teenagers. Uh, anyway, um, it is absolutely a recommend. It is a definitely watch it once. It is a real revelation for anybody that's younger than us as to what the reality of teenage years are like. And, and it's blunt and honest about it. And I think that that makes it worth watching. But I'm not going to tell you that you're going to enjoy it. But you will get something out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's it. That's all that's, we got. That's all I got. Um... Anything else? No. No? See you guys next time.